Hi there, welcome to the Upcycled Design Lab. My name's Cindy and I craft using recycled and repurposed materials. And today I'm going to demonstrate how to make a fused glass pendant with an impression design in a microwave kiln. And if you're not familiar with microwave kilns, they are exactly what they sound like. They're affordable, small kilns that heat up in your microwave. And if you're just getting started, they're a very inexpensive way to test out fusing glass. Before we get started, I did want to mention that if you saw my last video, I demonstrated how to make a fused glass pair of earrings. And I'm going to be going over some of the same materials and safety concerns in the beginning of this video. So if you go to the description box, you should be able to find some chapter designations and they will allow you to jump to the portion of the video that you want to watch. So the first thing you need is your glass and your cutting tools. And if you saw my last video, you know that I use these wheeled pliers quite often to cut my glass. And that's because I'm using a lot of bottle glass with curves in it, and so you can't use the scoring tools. But today I'm going to be using a flat piece of clear glass from an old picture, some broken glass from a picture frame. And so I am going to cut it using my scoring tool. So I also need a ruler and a Sharpie to mark the glass with. And then once I've cut the glass, I want to go ahead and clean off the Sharpie mark. So I have a little paper towel here and a little bit of rubbing alcohol. For the fusing step, you're go in addition to your microwave, you need your microwave kiln, which is a very simple tool. It just comes in two pieces. There's a heating element in the top and then the base where you place your glass. You need some fusing paper and some scissors to cut the fusing paper. And then you're also going to want to take some notes about the fusing process, how long certain pieces take, just to get familiar with your kiln. And once your pieces are fused, you may need to file down a few little pointed edges. And I just have this sharpening tool. You can use sandpaper or whatever you like, but I just like how sturdy this is. It works really well. I think I found it at the Dollar Tree. So it's a very affordable tool to grind down the corners of your fused glass. You also need some things to embellish the glass if you decide to do that. Some of the options I've used are alcohol ink, I've added some glitter glue in some cases, and some fingernail polish, just for some ideas on how to embellish. And then you also need your jewelry findings. So I'm going to be using some 20 gauge silver wire, some E6000 glue, my round tipped jewelry pliers, and some clear nail polish. And lastly, we have a few safety concerns. So when you're cutting the glass, you probably are going to want a good pair of gloves and you definitely want to protect your eyes. So you may need some safety glasses. I also like to have a, a paintbrush just to sweep up the tiny little shards of glass. You want to be sure that you're keeping track and sort of cutting in an area where any shards can be easily cleaned up and the paintbrush or a bench brush works well for that. And then you absolutely need heat resistant gloves whenever you're handling the kiln. The last item that people are concerned about is the microwave itself. And some folks are concerned about using the microwave kiln in the microwave where they also prepare food. I can only tell you that my instructions say to clean the microwave before and after using the kiln. And that decision is entirely up to you, whether you want to have a dedicated microwave that you just do the fusing in and a separate microwave for your food. So here's an example of uh, an impression that I've fused in a one and a half inch piece of the clear glass. And when you're designing your piece, you obviously need a piece of glass that's large enough for the impression. And you want to choose a design that's fairly simple because we're going to be cutting this shape out of the fusing paper. Another thing to consider is whether you want to have a finished piece just like this that's very simple and subtle, 
or whether you want to embellish the design in some way. And if you do embellish the design, you probably want to fuse additional glass pieces and add a back to the piece, which is what we'll be doing today. Another thing is that you can use bottle glass for this process, but you probably want to stick with the lighter colors like a yellow or a light blue. I fused a, an impression in this dark blue and maybe you can see it, maybe you can't. Um, but it doesn't show up very well at all on this darker color. One thing to think about if you do want to use darker colors or opaque glass is that you can do the impressions, but you probably want to have the underside of the fused piece become the front of your jewelry design so that you can actually see the impression better. But I like to do the impression on the underside of the glass so that I have a smooth top to my finished pieces. So today I'm gonna to be fusing another piece of glass that is one and a half inches, and we will be adding a back piece and embellishing the impression as well. For this step, I'm starting with my piece of glass and a ruler and my Sharpie. And I'm just gonna mark my one and a half inches. I wanna find a straight edge. So I'm just gonna mark my glass at one and a half inches. And I need two pieces for the front which will have the impression. And I also like to use two pieces for the back. You, I have used one piece just for the back, but it just doesn't fuse quite as nicely. And so I've switched to having two pieces on the front and two pieces on the back, which does make it a little bit heavier. So it's definitely a personal choice. If you decide that it's too clunky, you could certainly just have one piece of glass fused for the back piece, but, or you can choose not to have it at all if you want to just do it like a jewelry veil and make your piece that way. So now that I have my lines marked, I'm going to take my scoring tool, and if you are an expert at scoring glass, you can correct me if I'm doing this wrong, but I'm self taught and I've just kind of figured out how to do this on my own. So my scoring tool has a kind of a long sloped side and a short sloped side. And I always have this short sloped side to the front. I like to push away from my body and I try to hold the scoring tool straight up and down. And I'm probably going to hit the camera with my head. And I also use both hands when I'm scoring, just I think because I'm too weak to actually make this score if I try to do it with one hand. So I line it up with my right hand and then I'm just going to press on top of the scoring tool with my left hand. You should hear that kind of scratching noise. I'm probably not getting it straight because I'm used to just leaning over and scoring my line. And then at the end when you sort of slide off, you are gonna chip up the glass a little bit. So that's where you want that paintbrush or bench brush to clean up the little shards and make sure they get in the trash. going to put my gloves on now because this is one of the most satisfying steps. You get to just snap the glass. So you want to make sure you're going opposite of your score line. So I'm flipping the piece over and then I'm just going to press down on the one side, kind of trying to keep even pressure along my score line. And the glass should snap right along that score line. So I'll go ahead and repeat that process for the rest of my score lines.
So I've got my four pieces cut, but I want to get this black Sharpie line off of my glass before I fuse it. And I also want to make sure that my glass pieces are clean. So I'm just going to spray a little bit of my rubbing alcohol onto a paper towel and this Sharpie line will come right off. And then I'll just make sure that I kind of clean off the fingerprints and extra dust that are that gets onto the glass. So I've got two pieces of glass to make the back and two pieces of glass to make the front. So the next thing I want to do is go ahead and cut my design out of the fusing paper. And I showed you the heart already and I've done a few other simple sh design shapes. And for this design I've decided to make kind of a tiered square shape. So I'm going to be using two pieces of fusing paper. And I always save my scraps, so I always have some pieces to work with. So what I want to do is have a square and then a smaller square so that I get kind of a double impression. So I'm going to use this first square and then I just want to cut a smaller square that I will set on top. When you're making your design, you can use a piece of paper and, you know, cut around it. I kind of often just do sort of a freeform kind of cutting job, but you can certainly be more precise. So I'm just going to use that really simple design in the glass. And I also need a piece of fusing paper to cover the base of my kiln. So you'll see there's just a little round area here. It's pretty small. And you can cut your fusing paper in the shape of a circle, but I just think that wastes the fusing paper. So I generally just cut the fusing paper to fit my glass piece. So I'm just going to cut a square piece of fusing paper. And the fusing paper goes underneath your glass to protect the kiln. So you need one layer of the fusing paper on top of the kiln every time you fuse anything. And if you're making impressions, oops, that's a little bit big. The glass, you want a little bit of room on the edge of the glass. Uh, if you're stacking it very high, it can spread out. Sometimes it shrinks up. It's just sort of unpredictable a little bit. So anytime you're fusing, you definitely want a piece of kiln paper to protect your kiln. And because we're doing an impression, I'm also going to place my design on the center of the kiln paper and then I'm going to put my two pieces of glass on top. As I mentioned you can use just one piece of glass but I do think it just kind of fuses it, it doesn't it's not as nice of a fused piece once you're done so if you have a couple of layers you get a smoother cleaner you get smoother edges and sort of a cleaner top. So this is ready to go into the kiln and to fire the projects is very, it's sort of a learning curve. So generally speaking, you want to put your kiln base in and make sure that all your pieces stay in the, haven't slipped and stay where you want them. Then you'll put the kiln, kiln lid on and you will set your microwave. Now, I just got this new kiln. I have previously used my Fuseworks kiln and I thought they were all very much the same, but this kiln does take longer to heat up. It was much less expensive and it takes a longer time to actually fuse the glass. So as far as firing times, you want to follow the instructions that come with your kiln 
and then you're just going to want to keep an eye on it. And what you're looking for in a finished fused piece is a nice even piece of glass with sort of rounded edges and a nice orange or yellow glow to the entire piece of glass. And that's when your piece will be fully fused and you can set the kiln aside. But you will want to check it periodically and you'll learn as you go whether to add a minute or just 30 seconds. Sometimes you might only want another few seconds and you're just gonna check the piece periodically throughout the fusing process. Some other things that affect the fusing process are the amount of glass that you have in the kiln and also what wattage your microwave is. So it's very hard to tell you exactly how long you should fuse these pieces. As I mentioned before, my Fuseworks kiln fuses a lot faster than this newer, less expensive kiln. And once you do the fusing, you do need to set your kiln aside for at least an hour to let the pieces cool off. And again, the more glass you have in the kiln, the longer you want to let it cool down. So I've got my some pieces that have cooled here. And in this piece, I've just made sort of a round indented impression that I'm going to embellish. And this is my back piece. So when you remove your items from the kiln, you will have sort of a paper residue from the kiln paper left on your piece. And it's very easy to remove with a little bit of water. For the impressions, whoops, for the pieces with impressions in them, you'll have uh, an even more of the kiln paper kind of stuck inside, but it's easy to, to get out. And then again, you will want to rinse and sort of scrub out the impressions. So I'm gonna go ahead and clean these pieces up a little bit and then we'll be back to file them down. I've got my pieces uh, washed up now, but you will notice, I think you can see this, that there is kind of a rough, the back is a little bit rough. It does pick up the texture of the fusing paper and the fusing paper that I have has quite a lot of texture to it. So I don't know if they make smoother fusing papers. I've heard that thinner papers will have a smoother back, but you can probably see that it's a little bit frosty looking. It's not totally clear anymore, but you can definitely see through it, but it does have sort of a texture to it. The other thing is that there are just some imperfections that happen. I've gotten bubbles uh, in uh, quite a few pieces that I've fused. If you know how to avoid that, uh, let me know in the comments, but otherwise I just kind of embrace the imperfections. When you're done fusing the two pieces, you'll notice that the edges have rounded off nicely and you have a nice smooth edge to the top of the piece, but the corners will still be kind of pointed and you might have some rougher edge on the bottom here. So that's where I use my sharpening stone. And you can, like I said, you can also use sandpaper just to knock down those edges so that they are not going to snag anything. I don't worry about making them super smooth, but I do want to make sure that they're not scratchy at all. Again, you want to do this where you can clean up the mess and make sure that your dust isn't going anywhere. But it really doesn't take much to just knock down those corners. For this next step, I like to use just some clear nail polish. I think that probably any glossy kind of glue or sealer would do the same thing, but I like to use the nail polish just because it dries so quickly. And what it helps to do, hopefully you'll be able to see this, is that it kind of fills in some of the roughness from the kiln paper texture. And so it gives you a cleaner, kind of clearer looking piece of glass. So I'm just putting a thin coat on the back side. I don't know if you can see that there, that may be better. And so when you have that uh, sealer or nail polish on there, you just get a, it kind of takes down that frostiness of the glass finish a little bit.
If you want to, you can leave a more frosty look on a certain part of your piece uh, just to emphasize the impression. So you can play around with this technique or you don't have to use it at all, but I just kind of like to make my piece as clear and trans uh, transparent as possible. And this kind of helps to tone down some of that frosted look that you get from the texture of the glass. When you're making the impressions in the glass, you can use more than one layer of kiln paper, uh, as we did in the square shape that I showed you. But I'm not sure if you can see the difference here. This round piece, I used two layers of kiln paper, and for the heart, I just used one layer of kiln paper. And the reason that I used two layers here was because I wanted to do a slightly more three-dimensional design on the inside. I don't know if it makes a whole lot of difference when you're looking at it from the other side. Um, maybe a little bit. So if you're trying to make a more distinct shape in the glass, you might want to try using two layers of kiln paper. You do want to make sure that they're cut exactly the same and that they don't slip at all, but you can get a little bit deeper and more distinct impression if you use a second layer of the kiln paper. So for embellishing your pieces, as I mentioned, you can just leave them plain and not do any extra embellishing. I've also used alcohol ink to emphasize the design in some of my pieces. For this design is still drying, so I haven't put the back on yet, and I'm not sure if I'm going to like it or not. It needs some work yet, but I used some fingernail polish, some glitter glue, and uh, the Sharpie again just to outline the shape, just for another idea. And I think I'm going to put a little bit of tissue paper in the center when I'm done. Um, yeah, this one's not my favorite, but just some ideas of how you can embellish. And for this last one, this is just to show you that you can use different colored glass. So to make this impression, I had a clear piece of glass and then I had squares on top with the letters underneath. So I have a little bit of light blue here in, to make the checkerboard shape. And for this round impression, my idea is to put a wire coil inside of it. So I'm going to use some 20 gauge wire and my round tipped jewelry pliers and I'm just going to make a coil to fit inside of that impression. If you saw my last video you know we made some coiled jewelry bales and I'm just going to start with a similar process using the very tip of my pliers to make a nice small coil and then I want to kind of coil this loosely and sometimes once you get the coil started it's easier just to carry on with your fingers I was also thinking you could put dried flowers or different things in an impression like this. So that's kind of big. I might need to tighten it up or trim it off. I'm not sure which. So after some futzing around, I decided to make the coil just match my little air bubble. So I kind of rewound it and just, like I said, embraced the flaw in my fusing. And so the next thing I want to do is go ahead and, and hook my two pieces together. And if you place them together, they should match fairly closely. If they don't, you may need to file down the edges a little bit more, but they aren't going to match perfectly. There's going to be a tiny little gap here in between. So what I want to do is I'm going to, since this is going to be the top of my pendant, I'm going to go ahead and just tape the two pieces together on the sides so that they don't slide around. 
And then I'm going to very carefully just put some E6000 glue along this edge here. You don't want the glue to get in between the pieces because it will kind of show. You, even if you use clear glue, you can still see the glue once it, if it seeps in between the layers. So you kind of want to just keep it on the edge here. And I want to make it as even as possible. And then I'll go ahead and do the bottom. And I want to let that set up a little bit before I take the tape off and finish the sides. And this glue does take 24 hours to cure, so before you finish your jewelry piece, you're going to want to let the glue cure. And for the first few minutes, you do want to kind of keep an eye on it as well. Uh, in some places you may have a little too much glue and I may try to take a little bit of that off just so that I, it doesn't drip down. But I'm just going to let that sit for a half hour to an hour before I finish the other side. And then like I said, I'll let the whole thing cure for 24 hours. So while this piece is drying, I'm going to switch back to this other pendant since it's had some time for the glue to cure. And I also have a piece of my 20 gauge wire that's about 18 inches long. You want to wrap your piece a couple of times. So I'm going to start at the top of my pendant and sort of the center of my wire. And I'm just going to hold the piece, hold the wire in between the two pieces kind of on top of where I put the, the glue. And I want to just wrap the wire around kind of making my corners and keeping the wire as tight to the glass as I can and then I'm going to wrap a second time going the opposite direction with the other piece of wire or the other end of the wire And then I want to take one of my wires and I want to make sure that I bend it right in the center of my pendant. I think that's quite right. And once I've got it bent in the center, I'm going to take the other wire and wrap it around this wire just to lock everything in place. But before you do that, you want to make sure you like where your bend is. I think I'm going to try one more time. All right. So now I'm just going to wrap this other wire around a couple of times. And that should hold everything pretty well in place. And the next thing I want to do is I'm going to make the coil to hook my jump ring to from this wire. And I want to roll it about three times, so I need about two inches of wire. And I'm going to start in the middle of my round tipped pliers and roll down the barrel until I have it rolled about three times and I want to leave a little bit of extra to wrap the wire around again so I'm going to wrap So I'm going to wrap this wire around and this is sort of personal preference. You can wrap it as many times or as few times as you want to. And once you get to the end, you just want to kind of tuck those wire ends in as well as you can. And you should have a fairly secure piece. If you want to, you can go ahead and add a little bit of E6000 glue to some of the wire points, but really the wire isn't going anywhere. So 
if you put glue on there, sometimes you can end up with globs of glue. So if you've got your wire nice and secure, you probably don't need any glue. You can check out more projects from the Upcycled Design Lab in the links below or visit the description for a link to sign up to receive the Upcycled Design Lab newsletter. You can also join my YouTube community by clicking the subscribe button. Thank you so much for watching. I hope to see you back here soon in the lab for my next experiment.